Urban legends are considered works of fiction. But what if there's more to these tales? What if they actually happen? The next five stories are often shared amongst friends or exchanged with family members. But the difference is that these are not legends at all. These are the five most terrifying urban legends that are actually true. Number five, insects in the brain. If you were to hear this legend, it would play out similar to the following. My friend's cousin Mike went on his dream vacation with his girlfriend all around South America. The place was beautiful, food was great, and the people were really friendly. As soon as they got back, Mike started feeling a little sick, like he was coming down with a head cold. He started getting headaches that he said itched, as if inside his head was itchy and he couldn't scratch it. After a few days, the itching was so bad that he couldn't sleep and he was going to go to the doctor if it didn't get better by the morning. The night before he was going to go to the doctor, he just couldn't take the itching anymore and he went to the bathroom. He was feeling around the back of his head where the itch was most painful when he heard a plop sound on the floor, then several more plopping sounds as if something had dropped. When he turned around to his horror, there were writhing maggots all over the tiles. They were dropping out of the back of his head. The reality. We've seen this similar scenario played out in horror films several times. It's gross and absolutely horrendous to think maggots could live inside your head. But this actually happened to a young British woman. After coming back from a trip to Peru with her boyfriend, Rochelle Harris started feeling nauseous. Her face was in pain and she started hearing scratching noises in her ear. She woke up the next day and noticed fluid had soaked her pillow. Accompanied by her mom, she went to the doctor to have her ear checked. The doctor then referred her to an ENT specialist thinking it could be an ear infection and she needed to be checked out further. While examining her ear, the doctor was eerily silent. After several more moments, her mother couldn't help but ask if he had found what was causing the pain and noises. He then told them he had found maggots. Horrified, the specialist ordered an emergency scan to find out if the maggots had traveled to her brain, but luckily they hadn't gotten that far. The doctor first tried to drown them out by pouring olive oil in her ear. They waited overnight, but it didn't kill them, and having only removed two, they were concerned more could still be alive. They decided to operate, and after Rochelle was sedated, they inserted a microscope speculum inside her ear, and as they pushed further, they were horrified by what they saw. According to the doctor, her ear was host to a mass of eight large maggots. They were taken out and it was discovered they had chewed a 12 millimeter hole and had survived on Rochelle's flesh all this time. After investigating where they came from, it was determined to be a New World Army screwworm fly. Rochelle remembers walking into a swarm of flies while she was in Peru. One got inside her ear, but she didn't think anything of it after she managed to shoo it off. Apparently, the fly had laid an egg inside her ear, and from there, they just continued to multiply and grow. Number 4. The Funhouse Mummy The Legend Children poked at it, they laughed, some shrieked, others just found it fascinating. The mummified corpse at the Funhouse was a true star. Not only did the makers get it right, but it looked extraordinarily lifelike. The skin, the bone structure, even the bad odor it emanated. The audience just couldn't get enough. But as it turns out, the mummy they were touching and taking pictures with wasn't a prop at all, but an actual human corpse. The Reality In real life, the Funhouse Mummy's fate happened to a man named Elmer McCurdy, an outlaw and robber, Elmer was killed in a shootout. He vowed never to be taken alive and was killed during the gun duel after stealing $46 and two jugs of whiskey. Elmer was taken to the local funeral parlor where the undertaker embalmed his body. Proud of his work and with no one stepping up to claim it, he decided his work of art deserved to be displayed. He took Elmer's embalmed corpse, propped it in the foyer and charged a nickel to anyone that wanted to see it. By 1915, the body was generating a good cash flow. 
It was also at this time when two men stepped forward and claimed to be Elmer's brothers. Although reluctant at first, he released the body to the strangers, but the two brothers were in fact carnival promoters who promptly paraded the body everywhere before it ended up in a funhouse in Long Beach, California. A crew member filming the six million dollar man accidentally bumped into a mummy painted in bright fluorescent paint while shooting inside the funhouse. He knocked over an arm and was shocked to find a human bone inside of it. After it was reported the body was discovered to be that of Elmer McCurdy's, Elmer's remains were officially laid to rest in Guthrie, Oklahoma at Boot Hill Cemetery after 66 years of being a carnival staple. Number three, high beams. As the story goes, a woman is driving alone late at night on a deserted road, when out of nowhere, a bright set of high beams starts flashing her from behind. She slowed down to let the car pass, but it stayed behind her. After a few moments, they started flipping the high beams on and off again and honking at her. She caught a glimpse of the man in the car, and she was scared but had no choice but to keep driving. She sped up and the car stayed close and again started flashing and honking, and this time, even ramming her car. She sped up and managed to take the exit to her house quick enough and evade the crazy person behind her. With her heart pounding, she made it into her garage, and just before she got out, a man in the back seat rose up and sliced her throat, killing her. The man in the car behind her went to police and gave them her license plate number. He had been trying to warn her of the attacker hiding in the back seat all along. The reality. While there are instances of killers and rapists hiding in cars throughout history, this one originated in New York City in 1964. An escaped murderer was fleeing and actually hid in the back seat of a police car, hoping to kill the officer and then steal his car when he returned. However, when the policeman got there, he found him and promptly shot him dead. The idea of what could have happened that night is chilling, and considering how many people get in their cars every single day without ever looking in the back seat, it's no surprise the tale has become such a popular urban legend over the years. Number 2. Staten Island's Cropsy Cropsy the name may not evoke any special feelings to those who are not familiar with it, but for those who have lived on Staten Island, this word is a source of nightmares. According to the myth, Cropsy is Staten Island's personal boogeyman, in a story that every child in the area knows about and is frightened of, and for good reason. He's an insane kidnapper with a single hook for a hand, who lived in the crumbling abandoned ruins of Seaview Hospital. Any child that ventured too close to the area was up for grabs by this crazy man, and many people on the island claimed to know someone who either had a brush in with Cropsy, or even disappeared completely, never to be seen again. The reality. Cropsy is Andre Rand. Born as Frank Ruchan, Andre Rand was a convicted kidnapper and suspected killer who hunted the children of Staten Island. Rand once worked as a janitor at the Willowbrook State School, a school for mentally disabled children that came under fire for various abuses and the mistreatment of the students. Around that time, Rand mysteriously quit and was rarely seen or heard from again. But nonetheless, he was linked and suspected for a string of child disappearances. The first was five-year-old Alice Pereira, who disappeared in 1972 while she was playing with her brother. Next, it was seven-year-old Holly Ann Hughes in 1981. She was out buying a bar of soap with a friend when Rand pulled up in a Volkswagen, took Holly and drove away. The girl was never seen again, and even though several witnesses reported seeing Rand with Hughes, there was no direct evidence to convict him. By 1983, Thais Jackson would disappear, just 12 days after Rand was released from prison. He was taken in for questioning, but never charged. A 22-year-old named Hank Aforio, who was described as being slow, also disappeared and was last seen in the company of Rand. Finally, in 1987, Jennifer Schwager, who was born with Down syndrome, disappeared. She was last seen walking with Rand, 
and after a 35-day search, her body turned up in a shallow grave within the vicinity of the Willowbrook State School. After combing the nearby area for clues, the police stumbled on Rand's makeshift campsite near the grave. Rand was officially charged with kidnapping Jennifer and Holly, but no evidence linking him to their deaths was ever found. Even now, none of the bodies have ever turned up, and Rand is serving 50 years to life in prison and is eligible for parole in 2037. Number one, the babysitter and the man upstairs. The call is coming from inside the house. That line coupled with lights going out, a stranger shrieking and the phone going dead is something that has been exploited and used in various crime TV shows and horror films. The scene involves a babysitter. She's fed the two kids, changed their clothes, and is now getting ready to tuck them into bed. After getting them to fall asleep, she heads back down to the living room and waits for the parents to get home. Then the phone rings. She picks it up, says hello, but hears nothing but heavy breathing on the other end. She places down the receiver and before she can even turn around, the phone rings again. This time, there's no breathing, but instead maniacal laughter. Shaken, she calls the operator and asks them to trace the call. Then the line rings again, and this time the voice whispers, Did you check on the children? And abruptly disconnects. Soon afterwards, the operator calls back, telling the babysitter the calls are coming from inside the house. In some versions, the babysitter is attacked before she could call for help, but other times she manages to run outside and get police, only for them to arrive and find the children are dead. The reality. In Missouri in 1950, 13-year-old Janet Chrisman was babysitting three-year-old Gregory Romack. Sometime between 10.30 p.m. and 1.30 a.m., Janet was attacked inside the home. The cops in the area received a phone call of a screaming girl asking for help before the line got cut off. There was no attendant at the telephone board at the time so they were unable to trace the call. By 1.30 that morning, Mr. and Mrs. Romack arrived home and they found the front and back door open and one of the windows broken. Inside, young Janet was lying in a pool of her own blood. She had been stabbed repeatedly in the back of her head using what looked like a mechanical pencil. She was strangled with a cord, hit with a blunt weapon, and then raped. The suspect was a neighbor of the Romax named Robert Mueller because he had expressed interest in the young girl prior to the incident, stating admiration for her figure and mature development and the fact that she was a virgin. And although Robert was a prime suspect, he was never charged for the crime. So there were the five most terrifying urban legends that are actually true. Urban legends might seem like nothing but stories, but often there's usually a bit of truth sprinkled somewhere throughout all of them, which gives you all the more reason to be very afraid the next time you hear one. If you enjoyed this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel, and each week we'll bring you a new scary mystery to check out. Thanks so much for tuning in, I'll see you next week.